Yes, hello everybody. It's another great ev event in the series of lectures on coaching, research and practice. And today I have two lovely women here with me, uh, Claire and uh, Tünde. And uh, I think you will present yourself uh, in a moment. And uh, I think the topic is really interesting. Uh, as you know, I'm based on a department of uh, uh, sport and uh, exercise. And uh, so the body has a special uh, meaning and, uh, and coaching as well, of course, uh, but maybe in a different way than uh, we now uh, uh, approach it. So know thy body is actually quite central to a lot of uh, my students. Uh, and uh, uh, now you introduce uh, the perspective on the body in coaching, which is, uh, I think, regarding the importance of uh, the relationship, it's a very uh, high ranked uh, topic. Uh, as uh, many of you will know that uh, the relationship is one of the key factors for uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, coaching. So, and uh, now you also use a term presence, uh, which is uh, also very popular in, in the literature introduced by uh, uh, Sharma. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in that sense, I would say the the lecture really hits uh, some uh, important uh, topics and I'm really curious to hear how you uh, deal with it. So welcome to you both and uh, welcome to all of you, uh, the audience, and thank you for your interest. And um, we share the next one and a half hours together. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am happy to take the floor and Claire, would you mind pressing the yes the button so that I can introduce the entire theme today, which is integrative presence, uh, a needs exchange through somatic responsiveness. So we are going to take a look at presence from a perspective that is, as it says, integrative, which means we are integrating several uh, elements. Uh, we will focus on needs. We will focus on interactional processes in the relationship, as Reinhardt was saying that um, it's the relationship plays a key role in uh, coaching effectiveness and uh, the essence of body and how the body speaks and responds uh, um, on top of actually, if I may say, uh, on top of the verbal uh, language that we are using to communicate. So through the entire um, session today, and we were in two minds about what are we going to call it, webinar or masterclass, uh, we, either way, it's an experience that we would like to offer you uh, today in the 90 minutes to come. And we will have specific moments when we will stop to reflect. And we will indicate these moments by showing a frog. And the frog stands um, metaphorically for transformation, for reflection, for deep insight. So whenever you see the frog, we will call you to reflect with us, to check in with us, to interact with us and make meaning with us um, about the elements that we introduce along the way. So this is how about the process of today's um, uh, session. And uh, thank you very much, Reinhardt, for uh, inviting us, uh, uh, Claire and myself, to this um, and giving us a platform and an opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves in the first place. So Claire gave me the permission to get started. Yes. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Claire, for it. You're always so mindful. So uh, why are we here together? So why us? Why here? and why today. So um, Claire and I, we are here today from my perspective and Claire will share her perspective why we are here together. Because um, Claire, when I met Claire in the research project and I was starting out in 2017, it was amazing to see how Claire was happy, ready and willing to give any 
given moment, she was there to give. And I was just surprised and taken back. And I said, well, normally people want to take. They want to see like, what's in for me in something? And there is Claire, there is this beautiful soul. And she comes and reaches out to me and says, what can I give? And she kept giving and kept giving and asking me, how can I support you? And she was also um, running the Hellenic uh, coaches um, um, in the research project. So the research project was international. And one set of coaches was coming from, from Greece. And she took charge, she managed a project and without asking back or expecting anything back. And since then, since that moment when she found out about the research, she has been by my side giving and giving and giving. And I thought, oh my God, how can I give back to her? At one point I was like, what can I offer her? And so I offered a partnership to her to um, create social impact about, um, about the research project, the findings, the implications of it together. And that's why we started um, running webinars, masterclasses, but also, um, and we will show you later also, um, uh, a training program about the findings uh, of the research projects. So because she has, Claire has just shown up so beautifully in this relationship, I, which is in true line with my inspiration and who I perceive to be in this life and how I want to be in this life, um, that's why we are here from my perspective together. And of course, also because Reinhardt somehow seems to have seen this energy uh, and seems to appreciate what we have got to offer together. And it's today because uh, the research was finished just re recently and I completed my PhD also fully just recently. And it comes at a moment when spring is kicking in. And when I'm looking out of the window and spring is kicking in when everything is blossoming and it's, it's waking up, I have the sense that there is something about the research results that are also waking up and blossoming. And I've got this beautiful partner, Claire, with me by my side um, um, to take this out to the world, to create social impact and awareness for those findings and how to apply them. Thank you very much, Claire, over to you. Thank you. What can I say? First of all, I want to thank Reinhardt uh, for this honor, for this space. Thank you so much. And uh, all the audience that uh, who has with us uh, today and Tunde, of course, you, because uh, you're offering me so many things. And during uh, the first moment I met you, uh, you were offering to me. So thank you so much. We are connected uh, by the research, uh, as Tunde said. I participated, and not only there were there were other gifts as well, like our book, Reinhardt also endorsed our book. So many different gifts came into our path, but we are also connected by the admiration, the trust for each other, and also by our need. To, to share the learnings with others, to contribute into other spheres, you know, beyond ourselves. So to the other, you, today, the we and the all, because we are all one you know, in this uh, uh, life. Uh, I also like uh, how we can navigate uh, and learn from each other, so to make things happen. That's why we are here. Uh, and I'm here with Tunde. Um, here today, I feel like uh, honoring coaching, research, practice, uh, as the series of lectures uh, of Reinhardt. So we're honoring uh, those three pillars. And today is a present moment. So I think is the right moment to present. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to um, 
Yes, just again recouping that uh, our purpose uh, being here is... Excuse me, I wonder whether you could say something more about your background, because of course maybe people have read about it, but I think if you put some words on it, uh, it would be great. Tunde, you have just received your PhD. I was actually participating uh, on distance uh, to, to, your, uh, uh, to your defense in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a great experience because it was quite different than uh, the PhD defense in, in, uh, at the University of Copenhagen. But maybe you could see a bit, uh, say a bit more about yourself and your background and mm -hmm. probably also how you met. So I met you uh, through the Coaching Science uh, uh, Practitioner Handbook, which uh, I had the honor to, uh, uh, to, to uh, give my uh, words uh, uh, with it uh, before publication. And uh, that's also the way uh, I, I assume that you two met. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say a bit more about your background. And yes, can you see how we take it for granted that people already know us? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, um, Claire, would you like to start? Yes, I wanted to say also shows our humble part, you no, know, our humble aspect of us. <laughs> we are a Claire, Tunde, Tunde, Claire, but uh, yes, thank you. So um, I'm an organizational psychologist, uh, coach, and also a learning and, con and learning and development consultant. And I came to know Tunde two years ago while she was recruiting co coaches to take part in her research project. And she gave a webinar. And uh, while I was listening to her, I got really inspired by her pathos uh, on doing research, on contributing to the profession uh, by the topic. She was talking about the coaching presence and uh, how uh, was inspired to start investigating this topic and the nonverbal communication, how the nonverbal communication could impact this duality, you know, the coach and the coachee interaction and how this relationship and the body movement could uh, impact self-regulation, client self-regulation and goal attainment. And when I heard <laughs> all those beautiful things, I said, okay, I also believe a lot to the research and to the purpose of science and research together. And I said, okay, I made up my mind. I want to follow this lady. Mm -hmm. I want to be part in that project. And to, to shed more light in a different perspective, in a different way, my contribution and participation. But I learned so many things as a first person. So dude, I, was, I was data in a way because I participated doing those uh, research. And here we are. One thing brought the another. And as Tunde said, uh, I gave and she gave a lot. And so we want to give to others as well. Tunde. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, yeah, so I am a full-time executive coach um, and I am based in Austria. And um, I met Claire in the research project. And since, since then, we have uh, continued co-creating on a constant basis. And currently we are, um, Yes, the first book that we brought out is the Coaching Science Handbook, and it has got a non-profit purpose. Uh, so why we are mentioning social impact and why we are saying all the time that we are giving, because we are giving away a research grant. So the money that we are earning through the sales of the book, we are redirecting this money into um, a research fund. And actually we are inviting uh, anyone who does coaching specific research to reach out to us to apply. There is a website, uh, a landing page for the research grant. And um, yeah, so, and Claire and I, we have been doing this together and we met actually in the research project uh, when she said, yeah, I wanna give, I wanna follow this lady as she was saying. And um, yeah, like we, we seem to be just inspired uh, to do the same thing and we share passion 
uh, that is aligned and uh, that's how we are actually um, yeah, here together. And we will tell more about uh, why we are inspired by presence uh, later today, so very soon hope so. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Um, actually, I wanted to um, invite you, uh, we want to invite you into a moment of presence because this is the theme and because presence is not a topic out there, but it's a topic here, uh, we would like to take just a, a couple of seconds, half a minute or so, to um, check in with ourselves, uh, reflecting a bit. What is it that we feel, that we think, uh, that we believe that we might need to let go today to be really fully present here? What is a potential need? Because we are talking about needs. What is a potential expectation? What is a potential belief system? What is the knowing that we are bringing into this here and now that we might potentially need to let go of? To be fully present today. So we would like to take just a few seconds silence to check in with ourselves before we move on. Feel free to take a deep breath if that's how you like uh, checking in with yourself or any other way that you prefer using to check in with yourself. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you very much for this moment of presence. And oh yes, <laughs> yes, our journey. Um, as Tudi said, we want to ask you and also invite you to be curious and to let go that potential need to know what will come. And not because we do not have an agenda, we do, <laughs> but actually we want you to, I, we want to quote the essence of integrated presence and to allow yourselves to be open and to what will emerge in the moment. So to practice all together presence. Yes, because it is in the spirit of presence to work with the not knowing um, and, and we are used to knowing everything up front, getting a plan, getting, getting an agenda, getting, you know, knowing the plan, so uh, moving ahead. But in coaching, when clients come to the coaching room with us to meet us, we do not know what they are, what they are bringing along to the coaching room, to the coaching relationship. So presence is about for us here and now, it's one invitation again to, okay, so can you allow yourself to not know and just work with us with the emergent moment rather than have us roll out the plan? Uh, would you be able to allow yourself to do that? So we invite you to, to allow yourself to let go of the agenda that you might need to know to know how we are going to take this further. Thank you. Okay, so um, in this moment, we would like to, Claire and I, we would like to share uh, our passion about presence with you. And um, passion might sound like nice, but it also has got a breaking moment. Passion also means, in German, it means light. Yeah, it's also uh, the passion of Christ, actually. So there is a moment of suffering. There is a moment of pain in that. Um, and these were, by moments of pain, I mean, there were critical moments in our lives that prompted us to become curious around, hey, what is happening? What is happening right now with me? And that's how actually with this painful moment, this critical moment, uh, we took it up as a ball and worked with it and looked like how can we turn it into this passion uh, and an inspired passion to work with it. And it was, and we would like to tell you two stories, the way how we came to encounter 
uh, presence through a critical moment in our coaching uh, experience. So, um, and basically the two stories will boil down to the fact that the body does not lie. Um, in my case, it was um, with a female client of mine when I was hired by an organization and the CEO um, came to me and said, uh, Tunde, I do have a female uh, person in the company. We would like to promote her to board level. And the board currently consists of male peers. And I would like to introduce this lady into the board as a female counterpart. And uh, I would like to offer her coaching, executive coaching for that purpose. And he said, and I want you to make this work. And I remember back then in my enthusiasm, wow, cool, this is a great project. Yeah, of course we will make this work. <laughs> Was my, my mantra, of course. I mean, this is a matter of course. I'm an executive coach. What else, right? Little did I know what, that, what pressure moments this created in my body and how it would show later in the coaching engagement. But I was to find out very soon because very early on in the coaching relationship, uh, one day, it was I think the, the second or the third session, I, I don't really remember very well, uh, the client was sitting there and was saying to me, Tunde, why is it that I mean, I don't know, she was saying it in German, so I'm translating it in with my own words into English. Why is it? How come that when you're saying yes, or, or you understand, actually your body, and I was being seated in my chair, what, your body moves backwards. And I was not aware of what was happening to me in that moment. So this incongruence between the spoken and the verbal aspect of my communication and the nonverbal communication that was going on without me being aware of that. So this unconscious respond, response, this responsiveness that my body was giving away to her. And she noticed, the client noticed, and that made me very curious because she also said, like, I don't know if I can, if, what am I supposed to trust? And she was so articulate about how, what was going on for her that I really seriously considered, okay, I want to understand what this incongruence might be about. And she was also on the verge of leaving coaching because apparently for her, being in a space where there is congruence, full congruence between the spoken and sp unspoken seemed to be very important for her to trust the process and to, to work. And it's very interesting because we were having progress because the CEO was following the coaching engagement and he was giving feedback that the client was like performing and, and was doing well uh, on board level. So there is also yet another level of incongruence. How come that there is progress but the client is not, is, is feeling to opt out. There is something that the client doesn't feel psychologically safe with. And that prompted my curiosity to look into presence from, um, because I, I perceived that I was not present in that moment. I, I didn't even realize how I was showing up and what was happening in terms of communication. And then I found that we don't, we don't know much about um, this uh, congruence between the, the verbal and the unverbal elements of communication. And that, but that in psychotherapy, there is much work that has been done in sports coaching also, there is some, some work done and Strata was saying today already that sports coaching has been busy itself with the, with the relevance and the essence of the body in, in coaching. So um, this is how I came to, um, to be curious and passionate about looking into presence and of course the next question was how to measure it? How can you measure something like this, like energy? that is emitted by the body in a spontaneous way, in an uncontrolled way. And we will report about that later on. And now over to Claire, your story, please. Thank you. Uh, my story, uh, some years ago, six, seven years ago, I was at the office and in that period, uh, period I was multitasking a lot. So actually it was for many years that I put myself into this habit of multitasking. It was a busy day. I had talked with many different clients. Um, and as I was filling out the report sheets, 
something unfamiliar happened. I was confounding the information. I wasn't able to remember what I've said to each one of them. I remember standing still, frozen, and also trying to force myself to remember what I have discussed with each of them. And the more I was trying to remember, the more confused I was getting. I felt panicked. I felt overwhelmed for some instances of time. And I also remember wondering myself, oh my God, are those signs of early dementia? <laughs> that day, uh, I wasn't alone. And oh, you cannot see me very well. Okay. That day, I wasn't alone. It was a colleague of mine also. And I went to her and I asked her, uh, if she heard any of my conversations with the clients. And I confess, you know what's happening to me? Um, I don't remember. I don't remember what I said to each one of them. I was remembering, but I wasn't, I haven't the, the full picture. A complete confusion mode. And also I still remember vividly that day, even now that I'm sharing it with you, I remember the office, the colors, uh, the smells, myself standing and being in that situation and also being perplexed, feeling uh, without focus and concentration. And although I got surprised by this state of, uh, that I was experiencing, I needed also to find a solution no? because I wanted to perform well with my clients. So I came up with a remedy a solution that time and I said, okay, it's time I finish the conversation with my clients, I need to write down in bullet points what I've said so that I will be safe. Um, and I did exactly that. But that moment, what I've experienced with myself really caught me. And I wanted to understand more and to sense what happened. And what can I do in order to not experience that again? I started realizing that I was acting under the autopilot position for sure. <laughs> a place where I, I never thought I could be able to be there because I had and I have healthy habits and purposeful way of being and doing. That time, and I make it short, that time I was also attending uh, my yoga class and notice that I couldn't concentrate on uh, the asanas, the pose now that you're adopting when you're performing yoga and my breathings. Uh, I could not be able to hear my own breathing while concentrating on the asana, it was uh, really a, a huge effort, a fatigue. My mind was continually busy with work, responsibilities, fix, things that needed to be done and, so forth. And one day as I was uh, in the yoga class, for a moment, I managed to concentrate on my breathing and to, to sense also the moment to the asana and to the breathing. I cannot explain how I felt in that moment when I realized what it was happening to me. I felt, for instance, since concentrated, connected with myself, even centered. My mind, uh, I felt that it was detached for my thoughts and I could really sense my body, my past posture, my strength, even my heartbeats, a unique ex experience. Uh, and that was actually another big moment of realization. And after that day, I started to observe other things within me and around me, all the things that I was missing. And that was my enlightening moment for me. And when I heard do this research about presence and body movement, it really touched my heart. And apart all the other things and the pathos and all the things that I've shared with you, really got me more curious to learn and to experience more uh, presence. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to um, 
because we also really want to do the experiential exercise. Yes. But before we do so, uh, just to recoup the research so that we know which is which, which corner we are coming from. So just briefly, um, and I will start with the the latest news, the latest and greatest news that have just uh, uh, that I've been shared. Uh, the research project is was accepted by uh, the peer review journal Frontiers in Psychology. It's in press. So anybody who is interested in reading up the research, um, you will have an opportunity to get open access because Frontiers in Psychology is an open access uh, journal to get um, uh, access to the research findings and everything, uh, all the details that you might like to read up on and uh, so that we can actually um, focus today on the experiential learning bit. So just in a few words, it uh, has received a lot of uh, support. It, it got a Harvard grant, it was supported by WBEX, it was ICF accredited, it is a co-created work with the VU in Amsterdam Ashley Center for Coaching and Case Western Reserve University in the United States. So it's an international project involving 32 countries, um, 184 coach client pairs, uh, it was a project for which it was extremely difficult to get an ethics approval because we were videotaping coach client pairs over time and uh, because of the confidentiality issues, the GDPR, how to share video files internationally with, uh, without jeopardizing the privacy and the confidentiality of material collected. Um, was very difficult to get an ethics approval, uh, but in the end we got one. And one of the key things that I would also like to share with you is that we use artificial intelligence to um, objectively measure the data. And this software is called MEA, Motion Energy Analysis. It's a technology that has, um, has been used in psychotherapy and was devised by Fabian Ramsayer at Bern University in Switzerland. And it's a validated instrument that was used in psychotherapy research a lot. And it really measures energy. So the, as the name is indicating motion energy analysis, it is measuring energy between two people through the body, the body movement, the exchange, and it's called synchrony. So movement synchrony um, that he, yes, he has been using and, uh, on, on several cohorts. But in coaching, it is the first time that uh, we, we use this instrument and I was collaborating with him also in the data analysis phase to make sense of everything, to make sure that we understand the data correctly uh, on this huge cohort of 184 coach client pairs. So this is a little bit to get our head and heart around the scope of the, of the research. It's, um, it has got, it, it got validation internationally now and I'm very, very happy to announce it uh, to you today. I almost forgot it because, you know, we got the okay for it and I, I just inserted this information just today in last minute. But I think it's very, very important because also the journal uh, was ranking it um, on a scale of five for innovation out of five points. It got five points for the level of innovation and four points out of five for the level of scientific rigor. So I'm very happy that it is now uh, scientifically also um, really acknowledged and validated that it's a, it's a research, piece of research that is contributing to our coaching community. Okay, the next slide, please. So basically, what is it? Uh, that we were looking into in very simple terms. So I'm not going to go into science terms at all. Uh, when I encountered this critical moment in my coaching career with my client, I went out into nature and I and, and even looked in physics, like what do we know about this phenomenon of movement and the essence and relevance of movement and how and the energy that it's uh, it's emitting and, and how it's impacting the environment. And one of the, the most fascinating things, and everybody knows, <laughs> and when you look at this picture, it's a school of fish, right? And fish don't use verbal language. They don't have speak. Yeah? But they do have sensors in their body. Alongside each, along each side of their body, they have sensors. And through these sensors, they are responding. So they have a capacity to respond to pressure in the water that they sense. Okay, so they are using their sensory capacities. 
and they are not, so to sands, the danger up there, the predator, the shark, or whoever, a bigger fish. And it's not through this big organized, you know, we can see this beautiful way of how they are organizing each other and sinking in with each other. But it's not this big organizational picture that matters because the fish will not respond to the big organization, to this, 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 this school of fish. Fish will only always just respond to the next fish beside them. And that's the fascinating thing because in coaching, we also, we know that the organizational setting uh, has an impact on how we are working. So we call that the distal um, uh, environmental impact and context, but it's more the proximal, the closeness, the, the, the most, the, the closest thing to, to each other, to which we actually respond most. And in coaching, that's the coach and the client together, closest with each other to respond um, through their senses. So that's what we were looking into, like how uh, movement is showing up and it's how, how are coach and client sinking in with each other? What is the level of responsiveness, the spontaneous responsiveness? So not any imitated thing or consciously orchestrated responsiveness, really just a pure, you know, something that's coming naturally um, because, and, we, and we are not aware of the way it happened to me. So it's about reflexivity rather than imitation in the responsiveness. And it's about the capacity then to direct our attention to the emotions and the, the thinking and the behavior that we are having, how we are understanding the, and the energy that we are perceiving through our senses. And the senses are lodged in our body, not in our head, not in our brain. It's in our body because we are perceiving just like fish or any other animal out there. We are perceiving external impulses through our body, the first contact is through the skin. But we'll come to that, to, uh, through the, um, to the sensory capacities, the five sensory capacities later on. So this is how we were like in, in a nutshell, looking at uh, body, the movement and the energy between coach and client and its effect, as Claire was mentioning today, on clients feeling safe and self-regulating towards goal attainment. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, um, based on the results, we created what we are calling integrative presence or integrative presence. So depending on the English, some uh, pronounce it as integrative presence and some as integrative presence. We came to uh, define it as a spontaneous, so very flexible, spontaneous, unmeditated, unreflected and genuine responsiveness to needs in the room. What do we want? What do we need? It is an interactional capacity, which means it's not just about one person in the room, the way we are used to understanding that presence is about the coach. So we are finding that presence is not about the coach, it's about an interactional dynamic process that shows up through the body because the body speaks before even we utter a single word. So it's a dynamic process commanding mutual needs exchange. So what we found is, and I was also sharing in the feedback sessions with the coaches after completion of the project is that they are being shaped by how the client is showing up in terms of energy. The client's energy is impacting the coach's energy in the room and vice versa. Even if coaches do not want to take note of it, even if they believe it's not there, it is there because the data, the objectified way of measuring through NEA was able to show them clearly uh, that. So it's, it's very interesting, this incongruence between what we, what we believe, how we are, how we show up, what our level of presence is and what actually is and what shows when we really look at um, the dynamics of synchronization between coaching clients through movement energy in the room. So, um, yes, and by integrity, we mean that there are four spheres, the eye sphere, so it's about the, the eye, both the client as an eye and the coach as an eye. But then in the next uh, phase, it's about the we, so the relationship. Then it's about the impact the context has on that relationship and on, on our energy in the room. And this uh, context can be uh, the organization, can be the room in which we are. Like, for example, I am in this big room today, so that might impact the way you are. 
So, and then of course the online sphere as well, which includes the cultural elements of uh, the cultural philosophy, the, the, the societal uh, philosophy, the religious philosophy. So all the other elements and legacies that we bring along as a whole self. Okay, so that's to, for you to know like how we are conceptualizing presence. The next thing, please. Next slide. Yes, okay. One more time, the four yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, no problem. <laughs> our lens for today. Yes, and our lens for today is, so because we do not have much time, so we will just uh, concentrate on the eye sphere and the V sphere. So the eye experiencing the body through sensing in the eye, like my needs, because that's the key thing. So it's, we are responding to needs in the room and including our own and coaches have needs, even though we might believe we don't have and we are eclipsing them. No, we are not because the body is taking the, uh, the scores. And then we are also looking at the we sphere, like the dynamics between the needs in the room and we will demonstrate that Claire and I today. Okay. Next thing, please. And I think that we are ready to go. <laughs> we are ready to go with the first experiential moment. Mm -hmm. So the first experiential moment is going to be about what it's the eye sphere. So what we call the golden shadow. And this golden shadow is about our default settings. A default setting in terms of any preferences that we might have, any need that we have, um, anything, any belief, any, any emotion, anything that we, we, we use, especially in stressful moments, in critical moments, uh, that show in how we respond. And we would like to invite you to take with us three to four minutes. Uh, yes, Claire, you can, you can move on to the next slide so that I can show the questions. Mm -hmm. So that we take a few minutes, and this is an, uh, an experiential moment that each of you can do for yourselves, for now, yeah? Take a look at these questions for yourself to look into your golden shadow. And when you are looking at these questions, at the same time, let's reflect where is, where will you find the answer in your body? So the first question when it comes to the golden shadow is, what do you think that you love and or hate about your presence? Is there potentially any judgment about this? Do you have any preferences about presence? In which way have you learned to be present? It's a default setting. You're bringing it to the coaching room. Also, what is it that if you like presence and apparently you are here, so something brought you here to this session today, and you want to be present for something, or maybe you don't want to be present for something. So what is it potentially that you want to be present for or not? So what is the drive behind presence? And where is it lodged in the body when you, when you, when you try to make sense of, okay, so yeah, actually, why do I want to be present? What for? What's the purpose? So what's my need? What is, what is the relevance of presence for me? Like, we are very much inspired by that, right? Claire and I have said that. What is your inspiration, your passion about it? What is your need that asks you, calls you to be present? What for? And when you are in critical, challenging moments, also called stress moments, what do you know about yourself? What are your most basic stress responses? Are you a person that freezes, fights, flees, or faints? You know, when you have this sense of paralysis, when you kind of, okay, I don't know which decision to take. It's kind of, oh my God. So, and where in your body, when you think about yourself, like, how have you experienced yourself? 
What sort of most basic responses do you have? Do you show? And where are they lodged in your body? And then last but not least, because as I keep saying, presence is not out there, it's in here. If you think about your presence now and about your need now in relationship to presence, be it an expectation, be it a certain level of knowing about presence, what you know, your excitement to share something. What is it that you would need just now? And the bingo question, of course, can you let go of it? Can you let go of it, of this need? Can you perceive it as a need at all? Let's take just one minute to reflect, to look into these questions everyone for themselves. Before we reflect. Inquire into yourself where you can sense it. Is it in, where is it in the body? It is in the body. Right now, for example, I am sensing it's here and here because I'm speaking a lot, right? And I'm exposed to the screen, I'm exposed to you. And there is this thing going on with the speaking, so that the tensed face in the skin so I can very clearly sense my stress response. <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this moment of presence and looking into the eye sphere in particular with you to the needs. Let's move on to the reflection. Claire, please, the next slide. Yes. Good. So we can see the frog and let's take five. Let's take five in terms of what is it that you would like to share? What are your comments? What are your realizations, your insights? If you feel free to share, so we are not here to we just share what feels like right to share and or you have a question to ask to us and um, Reinhardt feel free to read out to us because I just feel incapacitated to use my visual capacities as a sensing organ yeah. to see the, to the chat box. Yeah. Maybe we can start with one question with, which is directly to, uh, to, to this uh, exercise. It comes from uh, Shaban. And uh, uh, the question is, my need is to feel in the body, but could not. So mm -hmm. can, you, can you say a couple of words to, 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 to that statement? Yeah, what I would be interested in is, I cannot. So what is the curiosities that Chaban has about this question? So if he says, I cannot, what is it that he's curious about right now? Because I can say a lot up to, uh, on this topic. But I, I would like to answer his need, not mine, you know, talking about this topic at great length. Yeah. Can I speak? No. Yes, can you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, because when you will say start feeling body, I'm started feeling from the here to the bottom. Try to look at it if there is something, any changes happening. But I could not see. My need was to chase, see any changes happening in my body, anything I'm feeling in any part of the body. Mm -hmm which I could not. Yeah. So my need was to feel it, but I am not feeling it. Yeah, okay, lovely. So I, I think that I can see what you are exactly. So I know how to uh, respond to that. Um, but even if I didn't know, it would, it, it would be okay. 
Um, yes, this, so this is a phenomenon, so something that you have experienced is absolutely normal. And we have seen it in the research as well, that this very need of wanting to locate something, you know, because I was inviting you to do so, right? I was inviting you into this uh, exercise to, hey, come on, uh, feel into your body. And, 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 and so we create actually by this very need to look into it. And that creates this stress because maybe there is nothing right now. And that's happening in the coaching sessions as well. When we learn in the training, who coaching presence is the thing we must be present. So we have this very inherent need. When I go into my coaching session, I must be present. How can I be present? I must. And this is exactly what we are creating a need. We have a need to show up. And this is, this is actually what shows in the, uh, in the body as because we show up with, with an energy that the client will perceive. The client will perceive that we have this need and it will show in the body. So I'm very happy that you brought up this, this aspect because it's precisely what is happening. It's, we are not even aware that this is a need that is creating a, a certain stress because it blocks the flow. Because if there is nothing, then there is nothing. And, and so the, the key would be to exactly realize this, what you have realized about yourself that, okay, so I'm trying to do this, but there is nothing, so there is nothing. Rather than, you know, the way we do, because we want to perform well, we want to be good coaches. So we have this need to perform well. And can we become aware that this need is kicking in and actually blocking certain flows of energy in the body that will eventually show in how we can respond to the client. And that was exactly what I was meaning to say about the coaches are bringing needs into the coaching room and they are influencing the client's energy and vice versa also. Because sometimes the clients will come in and will ask us specific questions. Can you give me, I need, uh, can you give me this and can you give me that? And we know we must not give any advice, right? Whoa! And then it's our need again kicking in and I can, I can even kind of like, it's, the body is tensing up because I know, oops, I must not. So we are creating our needs rather than, okay, so, um, you know, like, the, the way how we are approaching this, this idea is not to not have needs. So the question is not to not have needs, but the question is to become aware when any unconscious, unconsciously this need is seeping in, in so many different shapes and forms. So this is how I would like to respond to this question. And thank you very much, because it's exactly what was also uh, shown in the research findings. Yeah, super. Okay, something else. Yeah, there, there's a, one question from Gerd Rosenquist, a, a good colleague of mine. He asked actually, uh, and somehow I also thought about it, so what is the relationship between body and mind from the epistemological perspective? So when, when I heard uh, your title and uh, you uh, saw your material, I was um, immediately thinking about a, a, a phenomenological approach. So how, how are you based in, in, in from, from this epistemological perspective? Yeah, okay, thank you very much, beautiful. So um, what is happening is with the body and mind, and, not, and I would like to start with uh, the literature review that we conducted before we, we conducted the research. Mm. Uh, and what I got really curious about is that uh, we analyzed just purely qualitative articles because I wanted to understand this process like what is really internally going on in, in the coach and the client, and specifically in the client because we're looking into the client factors. And what I, I, I was amazed about is that, wow, so there is this, everything boils down to the emotion. So it's emotion and not the thinking because I, I had, I thought with my limited, limited knowledge back then that we think first. So it's in the mind, everything happens in the mind and we, we the mind is, is sort of we can just program the mind and then we will behave differently 
But then I was looking at these articles and, and we were coding them and I thought like this is, everything is pointing to the emotion and the emotion, so the emotion seems to be, seems to be, yeah, and I'm very cautious about saying that. Driving everything else, it's driving the thoughts, it's driving the behaviors, and of course also the mind can then drive back the emotions. But it's basically everything seems to be, the source of the thing seems to be the emotions. And then I, I thought, okay, so the emotions are, where do they come from? Where do we sense them from? And that fell into, into, the, same, into the same category of my own critical moment where I said, okay, I felt pressured. I felt stressed and it was lodged in my body. So epistemologically, what happens is, I thought, so it's the sense making, it's just your meaning making, is that interesting that, okay, I get an external impulse, like for example, I get the external impulse from the CEO who says, you better make this work. This coaching assignment must be a success. And I don't even realize that this external, it's an impulse, it's words, somebody saying something, or it's, it's just an example, it can be any other external impulse. And, and the first thing that happens, it's, it's, it's hitting my senses. And the senses, I'm, I'm sen sensing it in my body because I, well, I, I went like, I know, I remember back then that I got tensed up, but I didn't notice it back then, okay? It's, I went like, I was sitting up and saying, yes, sure, of course we will make it work. So the, the body was tensing up so that epistemologically what happens is that the external impulse is hitting the body and then the body is reminding us of past experiences, creating emotions and then creating the thoughts. So this is how we have come and it falls in line with also the literature review that happened where I see that, okay, so this seems to fall in play, into place how it's first the body and then the mind the mind in the brain. So, and I, I like saying to people always like, the body is not just a skeleton that carries the head around. It has got, it, this, our sensory capacities are very seriously uh, holding hidden intelligence that's driving our emotions, which are driving our thoughts. So this is my answer to that. Yeah, this brings me actually from, from my perspective to, to, to a question, because I feel, I mean, I, I would like to try to uh, bridge uh, between uh, presencing and uh, uh, being mindful. And uh, also in phenomenology, the basic idea is to be non-judgmental. And yeah. it seems to be that you, that you somehow, of course, you say, yeah, it comes to me. But if you put words on emotions, you are not pre, uh, you, you are actually judgmental about your own sensing. And yes. uh, mm -hmm. in mindfulness, you would say, yeah, but leave these uh, pre judgments out of uh, your system and just uh, go to your, into your body and uh, feel your breathing, feeling be, uh, to be in the moment and things like this. So how, how, is there something I don't understand? Uh, no, I, well, uh, <laughs> I know, well, your sense making is like, it's kind of like, I think like, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I don't have a problem with judgment in that sense, because we are in a dual world, okay? Just by saying that I'm judging, you are judging too. Mm -hmm. because, because the point is not to not judge, it's about just noticing like, okay, so this is the place that I am in. Okay, so I love presence because of this, or, oh no, I dislike presence because of that. It's not about, not, it's just to, to, to get us into this space of noticing and becoming aware. Becoming aware because then, as you are saying, we can mindfully let go of it. We have choices. And that was actually the entire purpose of this default setting exercise, to sensitize that by discovering our golden shadow in an open way, and judge it if you, if you want it in a certain moment because it gives you clarity of mind. And then, and then, and then let go of it because you have a choice. But by becoming aware, you know that I have a choice. I can let go or not. But the problem occurs when we are not even aware 
that we are having, that there is a need driving us, that there is a default setting driving us. That's where, and I think we are Dakora, and even if, if we were not Dakora, it's okay. But to clarify this, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I have no problem with judgment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Walter Esser raises actually the question, which makes it a, a bit more simple. The question is, can you be uh, descriptive without being uh, uh, judgmental, without judging? Yeah, well, it's again, so we are into this. Uh, so what are we doing? Look, let's stay in the present, okay? What are we doing right now? What are we doing right now by, by trying to figure out, am I judging or am I describing? Who cares? What's the whole point of doing this? What do we want to really find out? That's my answer to our Tessa. Mm. Okay. So, so I have uh, a couple of questions. I don't know whether uh, there are no questions. Uh, yeah, there's one question actually. Uh, one question Let's take actually. one more. Let's take yeah, one okay. more. Let's move on to the next exercise. Yeah. Okay. okay. We, we take one further question from Rike, uh, who says, is uh, uh, because she raises the problem of uh, coaching online uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, even maybe uh, coaching via telephone. So where you don't even see the face of uh, somebody. So what happens with the dynamic between uh, these two uh, partners uh, in a session where, where you don't, which is away from your setting, from your coaching pro uh, project, so, and maybe uh, uh, virtual coaching becomes more popular in, in these uh, days. So how do you feel the restrictions are? What, what happens with the relationship? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I had this question in my defense here, so. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just like injecting a little bit of fun because I feel so excited about this question. Um, like number one, so. Yes, we were looking in the research uh, at movement, of course, through videotapes, because that's currently the technology that exists. Okay, uh, the technology can only measure the energy uh, in terms of movement between two people when they are in the same room. It doesn't mean that it's not possible to measure uh, the same dynamics virtually. Okay, because it's not about being in the same room. We can sense, and this is actually what the whole point is about. It's about sensing, and I can sense through, virtually through the screen as well. I will not be able to do it in the same way. It will happen in a different way. But it can happen and we can compensate. Actually, I'm having my supervision sessions on the phone. And what is happening in the supervision sessions is phenomenal. I cannot see my supervisor. So what, because I cannot see, I cannot see, I cannot see my, I cannot see, I use my, uh, my, my visual organs to make sense. And it doesn't matter because I compensate through the audio sensory organ and, and also other organs. So what we are doing is the body is beautifully capable of compensating and building up and, and making, you know, like supporting our system to make meaning. So I don't see it as a restriction, either the virtual or uh, telephone coaching. I see it as an opportunity for us even, come to our action learning sets to see like how we are training the people to build up these capacities in a balanced way. So whichever situation they might find themselves in, they can have the same, they can build up this capacity to be spontaneously responsive. Because it's not about the, the, the screen, it's not about the, the phone, it's about our sensory capacities and how we are working with them in dancing in the moment, to use ICF uh, terminology and speak. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on and, and demonstrate this actually with Claire, how virtually we can, we can do that also. Maybe that's a, a, a better answer to the question than... Uh, a theoretical response. Yeah, go for that. <laughs> well, don't you tell me that the answer was bad, huh? <laughs> no, no, it was a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> no, okay, it's okay. So we don't want to. So, tell. Yeah. do you want to? No, the the questions we are going to address them later. 
Yes, we address. So we will have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we would like to do is just um, uh, acquaint you with the instructions for this relational um, uh, experiment. So Claire and I, we are going to have a dialogue. And we would like to demonstrate it through the body and movement. And uh, this has not been rehearsed. Okay, so Claire, I will start. I will ask Claire a question or two. We will have a very brief dialogue, one and a half, three minutes, not longer. Claire does not know what I will ask her and what the dialogue will be about. So this is not orchestrated. It's not prepared. She just knows so what this, the idea is behind this experiential moment. Correct, Claire? Hello. Correct. Can, yes. can I can I just uh, make a suggestion yes. that you uh, uh, don't share this uh, the your slides anymore, and that everybody in uh, in the session oh, now they can see mm -hmm. uh, that they close their video, then we can actually see you both only. So okay. I would like to ask everybody uh, or participants to close their video. And then we can see uh, Claire and Tunde as the only uh, ones on the screen. Okay. The That's only great. thing that I would like to kindly ask you to do is to reshare the slides because I want to just give the people a sense about the instructions so that they yes. know what are these two ladies doing there, okay? Yes, and later we are going to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So there are two elements that I would like to in kindly invite you to pay attention to. So the one is um, to the sensory preferences that we have. And we would like to demonstrate the sensory preferences by using certain body movements. So there are three different body movements that Claire and I will use in our dialogue. Uh, the, one, the one movement that we will do is holding the arms like this, stretched to indicate that we are so we are stressed so it's it's a difficult it's a difficult moment it's a difficult question it's a difficult situation we will move the arm closer to the body like this to indicate we are in a mid ground with how we are responding how how we are sensing how we are how we are sensing what's going on in the body so it's 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 lighter and the third movement that we will practice is, is putting our palms to, on our heart to indicate that we feel safe. So tensed arms, mid ground, and heart chakra. So whenever we are doing and saying something, we will indicate how we are doing in, in the body, what is going on for us. The second thing that we would like you, uh, to sensitize you to is because it's the dynamics of needs exchange is that and I like going back into nature when when finding answers to to stuff is that presence is a dynamic process so there is not one presence it's not one presence in the relationship when we are having a coaching session presence goes up and down and it's okay so, uh, and we have seen it in the research that, I don't want to go into that, but you look it up. The, the point is that it's important that presence changes and that we accept that it's like the, season of the, the seasons of the year. Sometimes we need presence that initiates something like spring does. Sometimes we are, we can use presence or we can yeah, instrumentalize it because it's in full blossom. It is, you know, it's, it's as, the, as, the, as the warm shining light of the summer. And it can also be a, a, a quality of presence that is almost fading away. It's we are fading out and, and moving into something else. I don't know, task setting, goal orientation, more focused on, on, on doing something. Or it can also be have a winter quality. It's absent. It's not there because we don't need it. The client doesn't need it. So I would like to invite you to also, um, when you are watching us, to see like, okay, where are we in terms of our seasonal preferences? With are we 
showing much the warmth of presence or is it just initiated but or does it fade away or where is it in terms of quality when we are working with with our presence can you can you make sense of it can you yeah can you sense it so these are the two elements we would like to invite you to watch when we are having this interaction three minutes okay just to to to, to make a, a question more uh, here in Claire, uh, when you said about the three movements, no yeah. one the extreme, the medium mm -hmm. and the other, we also uh, are going to use uh, different sensory capacities, right? Yeah. One we have the one, okay. So we you just pay attention to because uh, like, you will sense it differently in the body and with, with the movement thank you very much Claire for bringing this up with the movement we are indicating how well our needs are met right because if if you are showing this then it's kind of like oh my god uh, I don't want to speak about this or I don't know who who or this is oh, okay I can speak oh well, well that's okay and this is like oh that's very close to me and it meets my need. So, and yes, and as you were saying also, we will have different sensory capacities and then we can share it what it was and where we were feeling this tension or, or no tension in our body. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So if oh, you- let me, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, Reinhardt, sorry. I forgot it. Stop sharing. Mm. Okay. Great. Awesome. Uh, let me check something. Okay. Okay. So I need to prepare a bit myself because uh, now I need to think that Tunde, we are only the two of us. <laughs> okay. And I, f I think I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Um. Claire, in our relationship, what are the most stressful moments that you have ever experienced with me? In our relationships, what are the most stressful moments that I experienced with you? It's not easy to <laughs> to detach my my brain from my sense. So, uh, uh, but spontaneously, I sense uh, I'm learning. Uh, I'm learning to to embrace uh, spontaneity and to embrace uh, the things that are coming with more flow. And what were the most stressful moments that you have experienced with me? I don't remember <laughs> right now. I feel that my heart beat, it beats very quickly right now. <laughs> the most stressful. Okay. I don't know. And what were the most uh, beautiful moments with me in our relationship so far? Oh, many, many beautiful moments. Uh, Co-creations, uh, talkings, thinking, uh, laughing, celebrating, long hours <laughs> of discussions, many. Have you ever been really mad at me? You really want to stretch me today. <laughs> uh, no, mad at you now. Sometimes, though, I 
I was feeling that my spontaneous responses might emerge. Now, when you're hearing something, you are more uh, inclined to do a responsive, a reflect, not reflective, a ref reflexive response. And maybe sometimes I felt that, but mad, mad no. Would you like to ask me a question? Uh, I think that now, uh, although I try to concentrate into both of us, I sense the pressure of 34, that means, 68 eyes watching us. <laughs> I feel safe though, but I'm prepared to ask you something. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this demonstration. It was uh, really <laughs> special. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's reflect this. And um, first, I would like to see like how the audience, oh. what questions are coming from the audience, and we may yes um, to reflect this from the audience, and then. Maybe if you like, um, we can share what was going on for us to explain, you know, like in words to make make sense with words, um, judge it, <laughs> what we were doing, if, if, if you like. So, but let's see what people are most interested in. So there's a question from Jan Fritz. Do you want to raise it yourself? Uh, you know, uh, to yeah, so. because I could not see that, you know, there's a dancing, both a person are not dancing together. So there is a reflex action, more of a reactive action. Can you this is Ravan from India. Yeah. Can you tell us like what you noticed in, in terms of what, what you noticed, what, what was happening that gave you this um, sense making? Yeah, because I, I think Clara was more of a reactive space. Right, and reflective space. That's what I felt. And by what did you notice it? What is it that you saw? What, what did you hear? What did you see? Use your sensory. What was going on for you when, because what you're saying is an explanation. What did you sense when you were watching us that prompted you to make sense of this, like the way you did it? Because I was feeling like, you know, how the Clara will landing at her, whenever the question you are raising, how it is landing at her, and how that landing is with, reflected back to you. So that I was trying to observe that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, is there something that you would like to ask us? Um... No, no, that's just observation. Just an observation. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Jan uh, wanted to say something. Else. Yes. Um, we were just uh, speaking about. Um... You are very distant low in your voice. <laughs> My microphone. Yes. Is it a bit, a bit like this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were just um, uh, talking about the, um, the, 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 uh, the, there's not one level of presence, but it goes up and down. It made me, made me think of what Dr. Mick, Mick, what's his name? Um, he has this, this concept of relational depth. Um, and I was wondering, is this, is this directly related? And how is it related? Oh, okay, is this directly related? Yes, I'm familiar with the relational depth. And well, um, there is always interconnection. And what we are doing here is nothing new. We are standing on giant shoulders. 
And I like uh, stressing that I'm very happy that you're bringing this uh, connection up, Jan, because it's, it's a good moment to reflect that what this research is bringing in is just a new perspective, a fresh perspective from the body experience from in, in terms of energy, how the energy is actually um, uh, underpinning uh, relational depth. So that's how I, I make sense, it's, it's interconnected. So it's not that one thing is different from the other, it's, it's relational depth in a certain way and we are looking at it from this primary, this, the source of the body, how it is showing up and how it is impacting each other. So yes, uh, I, I believe that there is, it's, I think it's, we are building on that relational depth um, that you have mentioned. So there are actually no further questions from the audience, but uh, uh, we have ten minutes left. So how do you want to uh, how do you want to use this time? I have a couple of questions. We can continue by mm -hmm. discussing this, mm -hmm. or do you want to present something more? Yeah. Well, we would like to move on and actually share the questions, yes. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the reflective questions that we have for the audience for that as a takeaway, and then we have a gift for you guys. Yeah, and then we will have time to um, to look into your questions, uh, Reinhard. So basically, what we are inviting you to um, explore for yourself in your relationships with your clients is number one: what is your sensory preference in the relationship? And if you have a specific sensory preference in terms of your audio, kinesthetic, visual, or a multisensory, or whichever of the five sensory capacities you, are, you prefer, become aware, because this is a default setting, this is actually driving how you are making choices, uh, how you are responding, how you are showing up, how you are choosing your powerful questions, which might be not powerful, but you believe they are. So just as a side note, so become aware of the sensory preferences that you have in the relationship uh, and, and experiment with yourself like to balance it with other, build on your capacity also in terms of the other four sensory capacities, bring them all into the coaching relationship. The second question is, what is the seasonal energy in the relationship? Notice, become aware how you are zooming in and zooming out in terms of presence. And uh, talking of judgment, try not to judge yourself for doing it. Just try to understand, okay, so I am doing this and, and it's okay. And what is, what is needed right now? Sometimes clients don't like presence. I have a, a very specific relationship where the client is not interested in this stuff, just wants to do the tasks and the jobs and the goals and is, is brilliant in, in how she's getting stuff ahead for herself. And then we are just being in the winter season with our energy. It doesn't matter in, in terms of presence. So it's to get away from this need to want to use presence as the big thing. Um, in some of the webinars, I'm saying that uh, presence can help and harm depending on how we are working with it. So we would like to sensitize to the seasonal coming and going of um, the movement energy that shows up and become aware how you are working with uh, the seasonal energy exchange uh, uh, effectively. So how well do you work with nature's element in the relationship and what is your, what is your own seasonal preference? Sometimes people tell me, oh, today you're so expressive. Yeah, I am sometimes expressive and sometimes I am not. It depends on what is needed, how, how things are shaping up, what is required. So I might also be just very silent and say nothing and be, I don't know, just bring in a tinge of a remark and that's it because that's the season for it. So learn to dance with these seasonal uh, qualities of presence because we have seen in the research that it's important, otherwise you're missing the client, as we have found, okay? So good, so we would like to share as a last item, uh, please Claire, to, to Maybe to Maybe there's a very yes. short uh, question to uh, clear up. Seasonal uh, presence, uh, 
what, what, uh, or seasonal e energy. What do you mean by that? Yeah, okay, thank you. Because so the point is that um, we have seen that um, using uh, coaches in, in the research, coaches sometimes were using too much presence. So it's, it was as if the coaches were, for whatever reason, we don't know, but there was so much presence in the room, but then the client was reporting uh, very low self-regulatory capacities. So, and the way we were interpreting this in the research, because we, we had this over a larger population is that, okay, so when coaches are feeling um, that the, their process is off track with the client, <laughs> They bring in more energy to, to correct. You know, there's a correctional mechanism. They correct by 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 being by showing up more and bringing in more energy, um, rather than just stay with it and inquire into, or just stay with the client not being interested in in higher energy. So there seems to be this automatism bringing in uh, more presence is actually harmful. Um, so it's. That's what I was meaning to say by it can uh, help and harm. So it's not the quantity of presence that that matters, but the quality, like how well you are zooming in and out of your own presence and the presence with the client in terms of showing up and your levels of energy that matters apparently uh, based on the 184 coach client pairs. Okay, good. So uh, the next, so we would like to share a gift with you. I mean, this is the slide that you can then, so we are recouping just the findings again. Yes. But uh, let's come to the, to the gift that we have got to share with, with the audience is... Um, this one or the other one, the, the um, presence thing? Well, the, the presence forward, yes. So we, we came up with a concept that we call presence forwarding to, um, on the basis of what you have experienced today, What do you think, which part or which parts of yourself did you not bring to the webinar today? And how would bringing that part have shaped your experience with us? And we are asking this question, linking back to the default setting and the golden shadow, our preferred ways of showing up anywhere we are and with whomever we are, which is not the same. So we have seen in the research as well that coaches are different in different relationships in terms of their energy levels and how they are responding and their levels of responsiveness. So that prompted us to ask the question, so okay, so we would like to gift you this question to take it into your coaching settings. Which parts of yourself are you bringing to each session? Which parts not? And how would that bringing that part as well shape your experience with your, with your clients? Thank you very much. And Reinhard, uh, we are open to your questions. Yeah, I mean, we have mm -hmm. only two minutes left and I would like to finish in time. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe I have one last question of the many I have written down. <laughs> so. But how would you, I mean, there's always, you know, when, when, you, are, when you are disintegrated or you, you, you spoke about congruence mm -hmm. and if you are not in congruence, uh, so, and you are aware of that, you are not in congruence. How is it? I mean, there is always a matter of perform, uh, performance or perform, uh, performity in, so pretending to be aware or, to be related or so is there any problem with this i mean for example in this situation uh, the case you gave where you said yes and you uh, bent uh, backwards so if you become aware then you can say to yourself okay i have to be really on uh, onto mm -hmm. it now i have to perform something i have to perform maximum attendance uh, to my client now and this is not really authentic if you could yeah. say so yeah. so yeah. yeah 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 okay so the long story short uh, yeah. in our definition we are explicitly making a point of being authentic so to bring up your question which i love 
actually because this is how the client and I, we have come to reflect our own relationship after that critical moment is, what would have happened if I had become aware of the pressure that my body was holding, that I had taken from my interaction with the CEO and it was lodged in my body. And that's why it went back, because the pressure was like, whoa, it's such a difficult engagement. And it didn't lie. What if I had been aware? What, what choices would I have had? It's not about mm. forcing ourselves to do it just because, okay, now I have a choice. I can actually share with my client that I'm sensing this pressure, where it's coming from. Because maybe that will help the client, because the client was also sending that pressure. She was under even more pressure than I was, because she knew that she wasn't going to be promoted to the to board level among peers. And, and when I raised that question, I'm getting the, the goose flesh right now, because when I brought that up in great reflection with the client, she said, you know, if you had addressed that, because I was under pressure so much, and probably I noticed your pressure because I was under pressure. So through this, the choices that we have through becoming aware of our, how our sensory capacities are, have, are in default and how we can actually balance them to, to have more choices to either share with the client or maybe it might be helpful. We don't have to share everything with the client because it's not always useful, but to, we have choices to, to see like, okay, would it be helpful because maybe if I feel that pressure and I was pressurized, she must be pressurized. We would have, how, how much more effective we might have become. So that's, uh, that's my response. So we might, we have more choices. That the whole, that's the whole point. So it's not about forcing the mind to do something, nothing, nothing at all, but just to like, what are the choices that we have? And then explore in the relational depth with the client as Jan is saying, so there is a relation and, and, and the clients want us to see as a human being, as authentic human beings and not as high performing machines. Yeah. So, so, so the, the idea is actually to use this as a kind of extra quality to, to be in a the, in the relation to, if there's incongruence, to use yeah. this as a potential to, to uh, intensify the relationship. Yeah. yeah, use it as a beautiful capacity, as a, yes. as a quality yours, as a capacity that is, because then you are present if you are aware that, hey, what was happening and then it, it's a really truly it, it's a it's an instrument in coaching yeah okay thank you very much both of you claire thank and you. tinde thank you it very much has been a, it has been a pleasure and i think it was really nice that we got also some insights in in the more experimental uh, uh, dimension and i think uh, my last question really brought me closer to 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 your understanding and uh, and uh, it, it's really something where we have to work on the relationship. And if we notice some incongruence, we actually have uh, can use this as a tool to further develop our relationship, yes. both to ourselves and to, uh, to our client. Yes. So I think that's a beautiful ending. Thank you very much indeed. Thank it was you. a pleasure. And uh, thank you for all uh, participants. So. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll send uh, the uh, the re record and uh, the slides out uh, with permission of uh, of you both. Yeah. So thank you very much, yes. and uh, see you thank sometime. You. See you. Bye -bye. Bye, bye bye. Have a good summer, guys. Bye, Reinhard. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye.